Welcome everyone to the December. It is December, right? It's, it's December uh, <laughs> Thunder Spotlight Geek House with DNS Filter. Um, I'm Mendy, one of the admins of MSP Geek. Co-hosting along with us, we have Mikey Pruitt and Mike Sutton from DNS Filter, who will be discussing decentralized security or cybersecurity, I should say. Uh, which one of you guys is actually taking the point? That'll be me. Um... So yeah, decentralized cybersecurity is what we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm Mikey Pruitt, a product manager here at DNS Filter. I was an early hire here working in DevOps support product and now marketing. It's been, I've been in almost all the jobs except for dev and sales. So I'm waiting for them to start recruiting me. Uh, I have a deep understanding of our technology and spend a significant amount of time learning from our customers and our partners. Uh, this presentation actually came about after repeated conversations internally and with our customers trying to surface like the one true IT stack. So like the, the fabled IT stack that everyone's seeking out uh, and spoiler, uh, there isn't one. Um, but we did realize that the modern IT stack includes a decentralized cybersecurity approach. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. This is basically a layered security architecture uh, where an ecosystem of software work together to protect and insulate your organization. Um, and starting with the endpoints is kind of the key the key point there. So we're not advocating for the death of IT departments. Uh, that was actually mentioned in a recent Wall Street Journal article. I don't know if any of you guys happen to see that. Good read if you could figure out how to get past the paywall. Um, but instead, we want IT and cybersecurity to have a stake in the ground in every department. Uh, we've been digging into this topic, researching and evaluating software, but what we what we really want to do is is hear from you about uh, how this resonates with you or how you disagree with us. So I do have a, a script that I that I have, and I'm going to mostly stick to it. So it'll look like I'm reading because I am <laughs> mostly. Um, but uh, with that being said, I'll get started. <laughs> well, well, before we jump into that. Uh, sure. Mike Sutton, can you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do and we'll basically overview like what Mikey just gave us. Yeah, so I've been with DNS Filter for a little over a year and a half now. I'm currently in marketing operations, but I came to DNS Filter with a strong background in IT support. I had a MSP for several years myself, got bought by a slightly larger MSP, worked there for a couple of years uh, before I moved fully over to uh, the dark side and marketing. Uh, thanks in part to uh, Robin Robbins. I'm sure we're all familiar with that name. But uh, so now I work in marketing operations here at DNS Filter. So your microphone doesn't fit your marketing role. I just have to say, I do a lot of streaming and podcast stuff okay. on the side. It's my hobby. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, when, uh, whenever someone needs um, expertise on our backgrounds and our our you know AV setup, Mike is our go-to. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. Sorry. Go ahead, Mikey. No, no problem. Um, so, so the current state of IT. So IT enabled the migration uh, to digital to digital over the last several decades. Uh, during that migration, IT departments were formed and naturally centralized specialized skills and, and equipment uh, because the pull of both was very scarce. IT departments evolved into separate centralized organizational units tasked with managing all those assets. Uh, this is especially true for MSPs and the audience we have here today because you're a completely separate company. Uh, you're responsible for everything from designing the network, buying and building computers, installing physical infrastructure, triaging technical issues, signing off on software to be used by employees, managing all of that, and then the list just keeps going. Uh, so this method of IT at the organization level also led to cybersecurity occurring at the network level. Uh, the security fence focused on the physical location because that's where the digital assets were. Um, when IT is a centralized entity responsible for protecting whole groups of employees and business assets, the mentality becomes protect everything together. Uh, it's why firewalls and other network first security measures were in vogue for so long and often the number one security consideration. So after the pandemic, or sorry, um, as recently as uh, 2008, 94% of organizations saw firewalls as a critical infrastructure. After the pandemic, 68% of companies started using VPNs for the first time or increased their usage. The problem with prolonging the strategy of I central IT 
uh, that oversees the entire business is that digital assets have become not just necessary for each department, but absolutely integral. There's quite, um, it, so there's quite a lot to oversee. And then in addition to overseeing all of that, the IT departments have to approve the use of that software and that equipment. More recently, new technologies have been changing the game. So many of the tasks that used to involve complex solutions can now be automated by simpler, cheaper IT. Cloud computing, mobile apps, and open networking have allowed for a whole new era. There's no need for a giant amount of technology anymore because hardware isn't needed as it once was. Industries are, are moving towards software models and this march represents a better way. So Mikey, let me stop you for a second. Sure. One of the things that are coming out, and I know this is gonna throw you off script maybe a little bit, but I apologize. No, that's fine. This, this is actually what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that everyone's been talking about from a cybersecurity perspective, aside from like COVID, which came out of nowhere and, and kind of nowhere, you know, and, and rolled everyone over and steamrolled them, right? You know, um, zero, zero trust is like a buzzword kind of thing, or at least it didn't start off as one, but it turned into one very quickly right zero trust protection or you know what but what is that how does that apply to what topics you're talking about you're saying like everyone has a central network their firewall is important you know how does that how does that play in what you're talking about decentralizing cybersecurity? how does that play into the zero trust framework that everyone's pushing or, or, or how do we how do we even know what zero trust actually is what is the definition of it because it's used in so many different ways you know yeah I think that's a good place to start. Like what is zero trust? So I, I'm sure as you mentioned, like different people have different um, definitions. I would, I would say that it's um, not trusting any executions on any machine. Like by default, we don't trust anything. What would you say? Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's a good definition. And again, like you said, there's many of them, right? So one of the ones that I'm thinking of is how you know there's an inherent trust people have it's actually anyone who's watched uh, what's his name the five laws of cybersecurity. oh man the guy's name is slipping my mind right now but you know he says one of the laws is that people humans trust even when they shouldn't right it's one of the laws that of cyber security um if you think about it people they don't like they don't consider their network to be insecure right if they're, they're their network in the office or their corporate office not behind a firewall whatever it is or even at their home they feel comfortable there they trust that network to be safe even though it's not necessarily um and and as such you know the idea of zero trust kind of is supposed to at least in my mind be there to bang into the fact that hey just because you have a firewall or just because you're on your corporate network does not mean you should be trusting everything that comes across it Right. So in reality, what we should be doing with zero trust, I think, or with the way I've been taking it is that we should be blocking the traffic in and out of your workstation, out of your computer, your endpoint, because you don't trust that traffic necessarily. You know how the Windows firewall profile, right? What profile are you on? Your home, your work, your public. Well, guess what? It should always be public. <laughs> right. You know, this is a zero trust we're going for. You should always be setting that to public. Obviously, if you do that, you're going to break stuff. So don't don't really do that. But, you know, that's the idea of what I think zero trust is standing behind. And the reason why there's so many definitions, I think, is because there's everything is layered, right? It's There's always another layer. So once you say, OK, I don't trust my network, but I trust my computer. Well, no, that's wrong, too. You don't want to trust your computer either. Therefore, anything you're running on your computer should not be trusted unless you're specifically running it, right? So it takes that it takes that zero trust idea down another level. Instead of not don't trust not trust your network, you also have to not trust the applications and services that are running on your machine, um, which is where ring fencing comes in and application whitelisting and whatnot. Um, so it's just when like the idea of DNS filter. Uh, looking at the network from an endpoint perspective, right, kind of plays in to the decentralization of what you're talking about. You, where you, you no longer trust what's behind the firewall because zero trust is in effect, right? We're not talking about centralized network security because we don't trust what's on the network, <laughs> you know, and then decentralizing that security goes to your DNS filter agent running on the actual machine that you yeah, know... 
And we're not talking only or specifically about DNS filtering or DNS filter. We're talking about as a as a whole. Absolutely. Cybersecurity. For sure. Yes. And we did right that it goes. Go ahead. I'll just stay out of it. You guys got it. (laughs) Come on, Mike. Say it. No, I just I was just going to reinforce, I think you're right that it goes both ways. And the basic idea, I think the simplest way to describe it is don't assume that a computer on your network is any more secure than a computer that's outside your network. And if you think so, about authenticating everything at that same level of security, uh, like that's getting towards a zero trust posture. And then to your point about DNS filtering generally or DNS filter specifically, uh, that is not confined to a local network with the roaming clients you are applying the same level of protection to every computer, no matter where it is. Uh, that reinforce that gives you the ability to have that decentralized IT that Mikey's talking about. Yeah, and, and it's really funny, Mindy. We didn't prompt you about like what our opinion was, but it sounds like you agree with us. Like no, I haven't really, I, I, I haven't we gotten didn't there discuss yet. this. This is the first. Anyone who's watching, this is the first time I'm ever talking to Mikey or Mike face Same. to face. I never okay. talked to Mikey either. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> what's that guy's name? <laughs> so yeah, That's the first time dis- we've met each other. We, did, we didn't discuss this ahead of time. We didn't realize this. Just, shirt. <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't have one of those. I got, I got an MSD shirt. So. <laughs> nice. uh, but yeah, so, you know, like it's just, we hear zero trust thrown around all the time. And a lot of, a lot of that we see, it's like, oh, zero trust, install our VPN, route all your traffic through one area and we'll make sure it's protected because zero trust, zero trust. And I'm thinking in my head, like, that's not really zero trust, you know? It's like kind of, but you're still you're still routing network traffic through a single point. Like you still have centralized security. You know, you're still trusting the network that the VPN is connected to. You're not really checking what's going on on the endpoint at that point. You're still filtering and protecting the network. And it just it just didn't resonate with me the way endpoint protection would in terms of zero trust. Now, obviously, we can't go out and say, "Hey guys, drop all your firewalls. They're not needed anymore," because all the clients are like, "What the hell are you talking about?" And they're gonna go find other IT people. But ideally, we're kind of working in that direction, I think, where firewalls are not needed, right? Oh, so, so I, I'm debating right now whether to spoil the talk and just and just give the answer because you're like you're like dancing all around it. Like it, the I, whole point, the whole point is that whatever you're doing, like in house at the G, at the at the office, that firewall, that protection, and even more needs to be on every endpoint. And the endpoints are basically your new perimeter. All right, we can all go home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, so it's like the the idea of security has to shift. That's the thing, like, and that's the part that everyone's missing, and that's why you know it's always such a big deal every time something happens because, in the end, people are think it's like a car. Oh, your car broke. Take it to the mechanic. You know, they don't take any responsibility of what's going on. Hey. Your car is not broken. It ran out of gas. You you need to go take it to the gas station and fill it up. Their level of responsibility that's been transferred somehow, they've been taught to fill up their own car with gas, needs to now happen with security and end users. The, the idea of zero trust is not just a computer term. It's a human, like the end users have to do that too. They have to be trained. Cybersecurity, so I'm not a fan of security awareness training. But I'm not a fan of it because it's hard to teach the users for them to understand what's really important. In my, whenever I talk to clients about security awareness training, I always tell them, we'll happily sell you a product. And in fact, I'll tell you, you should have it. But unless your users are actually going to do it for real, then it's going to be a complete waste of your money. And all you're doing is checking a box because they have to actually take ownership. They have to have buy-in to the security of your company. And they have to care about what's going on in order for them to actually pay attention and know what's happening and realize what they're doing. And that's the so idea. Gonna, Go ahead. I'm going to ask Mikey about what was put into the chat about not trusting users in a second. But I also wanted to comment on what you said about having everybody go through a VPN. Mikey said that you have to protect everybody in your network the same, whether they're in an office behind a firewall or whether they're at home. Having everybody on a VPN, sure, that's one way to do it. Deploying, deploying thin clients is another way to do it. Uh, or having Every device, he doesn't like that way. I hate that idea. Uh, <laughs> but or to protecting every computer, and, and you know, this goes to the other point that Mikey maybe didn't even get to yet is embracing shadow IT, um, which I, I want to hear him talk about that first before I ask my question about trusting users because that's kind of the context. <clears throat> okay. Does that get you well, back on track, Mikey? That's my 
trying no, to cue you no, up. Let's, to... let's stay off track. This is much better. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So I will. Re- this is a, a slide we stuck in here because we know that uh, shadow IT is like, um, a, you know, a hot topic. I guess you could say people hate it. People people don't care. Like whatever. It seems like most people hate it. So a note about shadow IT it was only recently that IT departments were struggling to keep up with the bring your own device stuff. And now uh, after the global pandemic and um, uh, users deploying their own software, now we're dealing with shadow IT. So your marketing team probably has unique tools to them. Uh, They can adopt the tools, um, software that they need without IT sign off. And I've read Epic, Epic Reddit threads that are some guy from the IT department, uh, you know, agitated, I guess is a, a good way to say it about um, some team bringing in some software and now needing support. But uh, the, good, the good thing is about Shadow IT is when, you're, when those departments are bringing in uh, those platforms, they have their own support team built in to the platform. You know, typically, you know, uh, support teams are, can vary in their, in their scope and their abilities. Um, but Shadow IT is just something that the IT department is gonna have to embrace. Like it's here, it's not going away. Like we were looking at our budget for like SaaS applications here in DNS filter. And then we were like, whoa, <laughs> like it's, it's getting, it's crazy. So shadow IT is here to stay. I would be curious what, what Mindy thinks about shadow IT. Yeah. I have, so, I have thoughts about that too. Yeah. <laughs> Me so, and Mike have argued Mindy. back and forth on this. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing with shadow IT is that you're, you're not wrong that people will find their own products and start using them, but then they'll actually start. And then they come with their own support. The problem with that is that when their support can't figure something out or when something's going wrong, that's outside of their, that's not because of the application, but it's inside the application, then they end up on your lap as an IT person. From an IT person's perspective, shadow IT is a nightmare, not because they want to listen. I'm a power hungry, you know, mongrel, whatever you want to call it, but Every, not everyone is, right? So that's not the reason why they don't like shadow IT. It's because in the end, it's going to end up on their lap and it, they're going to be the ones who have to fix it. So it's they're not saying, hey, you only have to, you're only allowed to use the tools we want you to use. They're really saying is, if you want to use a tool, you have to tell me about it before you use it so that I know and understand and can help you with it when you come ask for help. That's really what I, they're I, saying. I was even more hardline coming from a tech background. Everybody would say, you, the only thing you can't protect users from is themselves, right? Yeah. I wanted, I was one of the guys who's like, lock it down, lock it down. So <laughs> what I've been asking Mikey is like, this feels like giving the uh, patients the keys to the insane asylum. Like, yep. why, why, <laughs> why are we going to do that, Mikey? Yeah. So the, the real <clears throat> answer, what, what, we, what we should be doing is we should be... The, 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 the truth is, and honestly, this came up on a Vcast, I believe, with Kelvin and Kyle a while back uh, about future of IT, is that the perception the users have of IT people has to change. The perception that they have that says, oh, the IT guy is there literally to fix my car or fix a broken pipe or whatever that's broken, and I'll go talk to them when something's not working. That's not true. That is a, that is a misperception that they have or mis- or whatever the word is, I can't think of right now. And in reality, the way we have to present uh, ourselves as an MSP is a technology partner. We're not there to get in the way of you doing your work, user. We're, we're there to help you do your work. And you come to us with the problem instead of finding your own software. Or even if we are busy, because we are we do get busy, and you find your own software, still consult with us about it. We're not, we're not there to fix it when it's broken. We're there to help you achieve your goals in everything. So that means when you're looking for a new platform, we may already know of one and we, we may be familiar with, you know, tell us your problem. If we're not, we'll help you look for one or you let us know when you find one and we'll look into it with you, right? So the idea of let's only go to the break fix repair man idea, right? That's the, the handyman idea. That's a misconception that currently exists between customers and MSPs, and it's very, very hard to break. Only the top level MSPs, the ones who are really, really doing a great job with the clients have broken that conception um, and it exists as a true partner with the client. And that's really what we have to do. Shadow IT, I believe, will fall away, not because 
the end users aren't finding their own stuff, but just because they'll be involving IT from the, in, from the beginning, the MSP will be involved in every aspect because they know, hey, this is a trust, this is my advisor, let me go talk to him, right? Just like they would any other business advisor. That's, that's my idea and take on shadow IT. So, so I, th right. I think we would say you're close, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, I mean, you're, but the, that, that's the, the MSP, same. The MSP model is decentralized by nature. Like that's what MSPs are, is decentralized IT for a multiple, multiple of companies versus sure. multiple departments within a single company. Mm -hmm. um, probably a few minor distinctions Mikey would make, but we're, we're close. No, no, not too minor. Push I'm them over the edge, Mikey. Too much distinctions, but um, <laughs> I think, so like that, that's kind of what we were, trying to grasp is that the IT department needs to be centralized. Uh, I believe I, I, I did, a really, did a really good blur. Let me find a centralized management of IT with decentralized allocation of resources. So I have a bachelor's in economics. So that's probably why my mind went there. But um, you can't just send someone to the marketing department and have uh, the marketing department have their own IT person like that lives there. So like the, the centralized IT org needs to um, supply marketing with what they need, but the people that are liaisons is the word we use, uh, should be like on loan for specific reasons or specific consulting projects. But like uh, we want to deploy ERP system or uh, change our, our um, credit card processing, like IT should be involved with that conversation. Now, I don't think that shadow IT uh, prevents that conversation from happening between an MSP and their customer. It shouldn't. That means you need uh, better management of that um, line of communication. But I think that's kind of the result of IT being so closed off, so centralized that the marketing department, for example, couldn't get the resources they need to, to find out which software that they needed to implement. So they just had to do it themselves. So IT has to be, IT slash the MSP has to be available for those conversations and then, you, you know, be part of the conversation, I guess is the, is the way, and embrace shadow IT. But anyway, I, I have more arguments, so give me a... There's, there's one more, there's one more thing I'm going to say that's going to over, it's going to overshadow shadow IT, okay? And it's going to blow oh. it out of the water in terms of everything else, because in the end, the way the current world is moving in terms of security and the keyword compliance, which is not the same thing as security, right? Is going to dictate what vendors you do business with and what information they're allowed to have. So absolutely a user can still go sign up for whatever organization they want for whatever product they want. But when they start doing any kind of information exchange, whoever that security officer is for that organization should definitely be aware of it. It has to be aware of it. The vendor that they're doing business with or whatever information they're exchanging with has to have had some sort of assessment done that was reviewed and approved by a security officer, not necessarily the MSP, but someone in the organization who is making these decisions for legal and compliance purposes. And because of that, there it will no longer be in the shadow. It's going to have to be known because the security officer, any security officer worth their salt, first thing they're going to do is go talk to IT and say, hey, what's up with this vendor? What do you know about this product? Are they secure? Do you have any information already? Let's get, let's get their documentation from that company in our in our file because we need to know what's going on for when someone comes to us for us to do a self-assessment because that's how the world is going. that's where everyone's going right now everyone the compliance is becoming a thing that's going to be required every every company you know almost every company does some sort of regulated business whether it's credit card processing alone is pci right or whether it's healthcare or law firms or accounting firms or anything there's going to be a level of protection that they have to apply and some sort of regulation that they're going to have to comply with. And that's going to force any kind of shadow IT out into the open. Um, but yeah, go ahead. What's your answer to that? <laughs> I mean, there, when you're talking about compliance and, and legal um, aspects, there's, you're right. There's no room for IT to be in the shadows. There's no room for, you know, me to go like um, sign up for uh, Atlassian product X and, and just start using it without any type of oversight. Of oversight. Yeah. I need to have a conversation with someone. And the, the means of that conversation has to do with the training of the users. Like as an MSP, it's probably really difficult to go into you know, a, a 20 person company and sit them all down and train them for a day on all the things you got to train them on. Like 
this is what a phishing email looks like. They could look like this. They also could have this. Like, well, that's what Nova have... Forest for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we actually have a bunch of. I see. I think we definitely just rethought Shadow IT. Maybe not in the same way, Mikey, but you know, we definitely just rethought it. <laughs> Shadow IT out of the shadows. I see like a book title in the future. There you go. <laughs> I'll co-author it with you. We'll have the two different differing opinions. <laughs> You yeah. don't want people coming to you for everything as an IT provider either. They, we, and we talked about an example like that this morning, where if we if we have a tool that we're using, and now we're concerned about uh, this uh, Logforge, log, Logforge example, debate on what we call that, right? Logforge, uh, log for show, Logforge show. Log for show. <laughs> uh, IT is going to have concern from a compliance standpoint if that brings any threat onto the network. But as a as as IT, I don't want that department coming to me every time they need support from the provider themselves. And I think it's finding that balance. We're not saying that, you know, you're not going to have any centralized IT. There's got to be oversight. <laughs> as, as a Somebody's current MSP, Mike, I'm going to tell you that I definitely want my customer coming to me for every single product they decide to use. Well, and, to let you know that they're using it, yes, but not for every support issue that they have. Yeah, sure. That's literally one really? of the services that we provide is vendor liaison. If you have a problem with it, with anything. Yeah. I can right. most of the time. I'm not getting any support on this, I guess. But <laughs> the, the, <laughs> most of the time, I because our our goal is to keep the users running and their frustration levels down. So if they're gonna if they have to start chasing down like 30 different support companies, I, again, yeah, we sure. want decentralized support, but we want one place for them to go to. Sure, so, but I have tools that I work with every day. If I have to open a ticket with my IT department, it's going to slow me down versus just taking it here myself. Now, I'm a more advanced user. I get that. I might not be a typical use case, but across our company, we see the same thing in every department. There's There are people that use these tools that can contact support. Yes, they need oversight from IT to bring new tools in, but we're not talking about, you know, people who can't figure out how to open their email, figure out where the power button is here. Right. Which I, I absolutely have supported as an IT guy. I understand that those people are out there. <laughs> there there's a level but it's finding of a balance. balance, I guess, that you, like you're saying. But in the end, like it, if if a situation's going on that's going to be widespread, let's say AWS outage is a perfect example, right? Then you're right. MSPs are in a very bad position because what you're talking about at that point, if you have a centralized system that's relying on a cloud, platform that's down that's that, that the MSP can't do anything about right then we're dealing with hundreds of thousands of phone calls coming in nonstop and complaints that we can't deal with other than sorry it's a known issue have a nice day um and we have to handle that load while it's happening <clears throat> but the trade-off of that is no shadow IT <laughs> which is something I, that I we, would argue that we we want to achieve because when something is in our control Right. If it's a web filter we put up there, let's say, or or on the agent or one of the systems that we're doing is conflicting or something broken, even even having that knowledge, right? If we did if we had clients calling support directly, I'm just gonna say this one last part, then I'll let you speak. Sorry. But if we had clients calling their support directly instead of us, we would never know about widespread issues. The first time we'd get a report from one ra random user who decided to call us instead of the support guy, would be like, okay. Cool. What's going on? You know, we wouldn't have that uh, that information coming in telling us what's going on. So you're uh, you're embedded significantly within their uh, workflows for as a, as a partner. Yeah, as a as a partner with the client, uh, as their IT partner and solutions provider, we want to be the one to consult on, to assist, to provide direction and advice on any IT decision or problem that they're having. Absolutely. And if I'm wrong, chat, you know, just blow me up because Gavin's waiting <laughs> for something that he can start yelling at me about. Um, it sounds yeah, like Daniel's Mikey like has been most traumatized. Vendors, <laughs> most vendors support suck. They ban it all the time. I agree. This is one of the problems that we have. Like, you know, one of the rules that we had was don't call vendor support unless after three different people in our company have already looked at it and can't fix it, right? into it is a perfect example of a vendor who can't fix anything unless it's something inside the the actual accounting package or whatever you know um so let me ask you this from a security standpoint are you scared of shadow it from that angle from security or just from support and 
you know. From a security, so I, I don't know, are you scared of is a, is a very strong term, mostly because I'm not scared of anything. <laughs> Our contracts and agreements protect us. If something happens because someone does something stupid, they're paying for it. That's the bottom line. Um, so if we don't know that they're running something on the organization and it causes them to lose all their data or whatever, then, you know, yeah, obviously it sucks and it's going to cause a lot of work for us. Uh, but in the end, if they did it outside the agreement, then they're, then all the work is billable. So they're the ones paying for it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm scared of it. I, I, I think that any concerns that I would have had, while I cannot stand the new push for compliance, and the misconceptions that occur, like the mix-ups between security and compliance that are currently ongoing, the push for it, like I recognize that as being a good thing because in the end, users are now being forced. Like I read a quote one time, it was like, computers is the only tool where the user using the tool does not know how to use it, but for but are required to use it for their job, right? So like a, you're never gonna ask a carpenter, carpenter's never gonna go up to, so I want to say, hey, how do you use a hammer, right? Like they know how to use a hammer. That's their tool. It's a required part of their job. That's what they need to do. Right? A computer is the only tool where the user doesn't need to actually know how to use it in order to do their job, even though it's a required part of their job, right? Um, and and now compliance is coming along and saying, no, you you can't throw up your hands, say technology, I don't understand, walk away, because the users have to be aware and 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 be trained on what's considered good and bad, you know, on healthy, secure hygiene of the computer use internet browsing and emails and so on and so forth. Um, and now it's required, otherwise you're you're outside of compliance. And and I think that's a good thing, even though it's gonna suck for the first 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I agree that the user training could solve some of that. Um, users are getting more sophisticated as time goes on. You know, they, they will need less help pushing the button on their hard drive or whatever. But I would also argue that um, uh, building a layered stack with modern tools like DNS filter or DNS filtering can actually, um, you know, build that perimeter around the endpoint so that if the user goes off and does uh, invest in some shadow IT software, that if that software had a breach of some sort or there was some other issue, that the stack you build around your endpoints can save you or, or prevent that data breach. And that would be less support headache for you if you can offload that, um, you know, the support aspects anyway, like obviously users are always gonna need help in consulting, but offloading the cybersecurity element to trusted tools is a way to solve the concern over shadow IT, at least from the security aspect. That's, that's an interesting point. I actually wanna, dig into for one second what what is the true problem with shadow it let's see right. what, what what do people actually and i understand you don't consider it a problem right that's okay. that's the thing no but what is the actual problem with shadow it and i'll tell you at least from my perspective uh the problem with shadow it isn't that we don't know about it and it's not that uh we're not the ones supporting it that's not the problem either if if you're right, let's say they have it, let's say they get, I don't know, someone signs up with NetSuite without telling us and they move their entire CRM. Like we, we've actually had customers do that before. You know, they've moved their entire CRM to the cloud on some platform and they had some consultant do it for them and they, they never told us, you know. Um, I, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. As long as they're not calling me about it, it doesn't bother me, right? So in terms of that, that's not the problem with Shadow IT. The problem that we have with Shadow IT, at least up until you know, whatever is considered modern day, is that they don't end up going back to their support. There is inevitably going to be a problem with the endpoint that comes to us. And they're going to say, hey, I can't print a screen inside this program called Salesforce. And we're going to go, what the hell is Salesforce? You weren't on it five months ago, right? Or, or whatever their application is. We can't get this autoflow trigger to run. And they say it's because the, the browser is broken or something. They're gonna blend, there's gonna be something that's gonna be blamed on the endpoint and it's gonna come back to us for support because vendor support, almost all vendor support will support the product up until they can prove it's not the product, right? And then say, I don't know what's going on, call your IT company. That's generally how it works. So because we know it's gonna end up on our lap, that is the only reason why at least as far as I'm concerned, why I have a problem with shadow IT up until 
whatever day you want to call consider modern when security became key. Here's the other part of what you were talking about, right? How you can build layers around it to protect the information. If the person, if the core product stores that data, then you can build as many layers as you want around it, but you're still giving them that data, right? If the user you're author, like the user's authorizing them to do data information exchange and, and creating integrations, and it's able to pull that information out, right? It doesn't matter about your protection on the endpoint if that data gets breached. If, if they have a compromise on that vendor, any data that you did exchange with them is now problematic. And if that vendor didn't go through proper vetting by the organization to make sure that a legal or security or compliance or IT saying this is a good or documented or well-known problem, then a let's say for example someone does sign up with Atlassian or you know whatever vendor we're talking about Asana and doesn't tell IT right, and then Asana comes out and says hey we had a breach. Well, guess what? The users who are using Asana are not paying attention to that because it's a security bulletin for IT and IT people are only looking at it. The IT people are looking and go, we don't use that, it's okay, and move on, right? And now we just have, because of shadow IT, it just slipped through the, through the cracks. So there we have the other problem we have with shadow IT that just came out, of, came out because of security. And no matter whatever number of layers you put on the endpoint, right, protecting the, or the organization's um, resources, I think the official term is assets, right? Protecting the assets and knowledge uh, data of the organization doesn't help when the data exists in the client, in the company, in the cloud that was compromised. So that's why shadow IT really doesn't have a place in the coming, you know, in the coming days with compliance and security, at least as far so as do, I'm concerned. <laughs> do, do you find that you've got this completely locked down? You have, don't have a problem with shadow Absolutely IT? Absolutely not. No. No, no, you don't have a problem or no, you don't have it under control. No, we don't have it under control. I, I would, I would, okay. I would be, I would challenge anyone who says they have anything under full control because it's so, just impossible. So, right. <laughs> so I think that's exactly Mike's point that Mikey's point though, is that it's happening. We have but, to accept that it's happening and we have to account for it. We have to mitigate that risk. I'm not disagreeing with you that in an ideal world, it doesn't exist and it doesn't hurt our workload because we can there's serve a, all of our clients' needs. There's a difference between but it's acceptance. There. There's a difference between acceptance and realizing it's there and accounting for it. Accepting but, it only how bad well, you that, feel about acceptance it. Acceptance is the no, first step absolutely of incorrect. Right? <laughs> no, that's not that's not true because when you accept it, it now becomes okay. And I don't think you're gonna have no, anyone... no, no. I no, I don't. Th well, I, I'm sorry. I'll let you finish, but yeah. I, I, don't think, I have a different say, definition of acceptance. I don't think you have anyone who's gonna say that it's okay to have shadow IT. And, and I'm not saying that it's going to be around forever, right? Because I, in my opinion, the push for compliance, again, the reason why we don't have it under control is because clients don't like to follow anything that's technology or compliance. They like to push that all off to other people and, and say it's not their problem, right? But we will eventually have it under control to a point where it's been mitigated. And I'm not disagreeing that, you know, layers around security is important. Obviously it is. Right, but it's not going to help solve or protect shadow IT in situations where you just don't know about it. Um, sure. So, so we can uh, we, we agree that shadow IT is out there. We can yes. uh, d disagree on how much we should uh, resign ourselves to it or fight against it, right, <laughs> or embrace it. Uh, regardless. The same security principles apply. We've got to be able to protect these networks. These things are happening. We still sure. have to provide that security. And I think IT support aside, the cybersecurity aspect of uh, decentralized IT is 100% valid for every one of us on the call. Yes. All right, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I was having fun. All right, let's move on. Yeah, shadow, <laughs> sorry, shadow sorry IT, to- uh, It's like- it's, Mike's it's like, I got so, a schedule like here. A this is supposed topic. to happen last Wednesday. Let's get this over with, man. Come on, let's go, guys. What are you oh, for? I thought I got my cue. That was it. Ra time to wrap it up. No, uh, that was fun. The I have pulled up a bunch of cyber breaches, and you can just see like all the different avenues that they were, um, the vectors used to to make these attacks. Uh, just kind of reiterating the importance of multiple layers, but that that's kind of you know I think we. We hit all the topics we wanted, had a, had a good discussion. Um, I would actually entertain any questions from the audience. I've been looking at the chat. Let's see. That's and the MSP geek 
MSP Geek Chat. Scott asked me about Golang, strongly disagrees. I would love to know why. <laughs> Guys, we, we can bring anyone who wants to talk, we can bring them up and allow them to speak uh, over using voice specifically. I can just allow them to talk from Zoom. So if someone wants to chime into the conversation or bring up any questions or whatever, throw it in the chat. Uh, Daniel or Gavin, the next person who sends a message, I'm going to turn your mic on and then you can speak. Yeah, come in. <laughs> uh, Mandy, we should have started with this slide and just skipped the rest of the presentation. Yeah, right? there we go. Let's go. <laughs> um, this yeah, is how I, Mikey and I warm up anyway. So there, we're, that's yeah. it. there we go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the end is that we live in a very uncertain time. Right. Everyone is currently changing still. There's still the legacy IT thinking where firewalls are, are the end all be all and, and required to protect the network and the people inside. Like there's a LAN and a WAN, right? The fact that those zones exist kind of beyond routing, I'm assuming, I'm saying there's a trust level difference between those two zones. Um, I'm not saying it shouldn't be there, but the amount of trust we put on the LAN is now wrong, I'm going to say. Yeah. And that trust has to be limited to the computer from a network. Or decentralized, standpoint. I believe is the word you're looking for. Decentralized. <laughs> and it should be more focused on the agent from a network perspective, but then even from a from a different if from a different focus, we want to also train the users not to trust. Right. And that's one of the like here, you know what the most popular question we get for regarding spam filter is? Hey, can you whitelist this email address? <laughs> No, the, no, you the can't. argument we're, for no. why some no, VP needs to be to able to install a an email Steam address. on his computer, right? Yeah, well, this is specifically an email question, right? Like, how many times do we see people who get an email compromise going on? It doesn't matter if you do business with them. It doesn't matter if they send you a lot of money normally, or if you send them a lot of money, or how, you know, I don't care. The bottom line is, is they're still susceptible to getting compromised, and if they send you malware and we won't list that address, we're not necessarily going to catch that malware. Right, so we don't want to whitelist anything, and that's a rule that we've actually created within our organization. And I understand that we're talking about layers, Mikey. So I understand okay. that if someone sends <laughs> malware, it should hand. not even execute. Yeah, I saw your finger go up. We're talking about layers here. The idea is is the users need to understand the idea of zero trust. Just because you're communicating with that person doesn't mean you're actually communicating with that person, right? Multi-factor authentication, have multiple confirmations when you're sending money and when wire changes, you know, when, when, the, when the payment uh, method changes. Make sure through phone call, text, email, you know, these are policies that users have to create in order to protect their businesses because they have to understand that you can't just trust someone just because it's got their name on it, right? So that focus of zero trust doesn't apply just to networks. It needs to apply to people too. It has to apply to the processes and applications that are running on the, on the system. And it has to, like, we, how many times someone says, oh, it's, it's uh, I don't know, pick a, any popular vendor. They're I, never going to get hacked. I, I, have, I have a good yeah. example for you, Mandy. Sure. I shouldn't admit to this, but remember <laughs> uh, Zoom had all those security problems at the beginning, like in March of last year, right? That's a There's a class yeah, action ahead. suit. Yep. There's a class action suit. I got an email that I might be eligible to participate in the class action suit, click this link and enter your information. And if it goes through, you, you'll be included. What do I do? I immediately click the link. I immediately start filling out my information. I get serious? all the way to the end of the form before I think, hey, wait a second, uh, who am I sending this to? This, this oh, is why you're in marketing. And now, I know right? what I'm doing. <laughs> like, it's, it's super easy. It's uh -huh. super easy. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually like there are people and, and you think it's like, oh, okay, that's never going to happen to me. But when, like there was a, when the solar winds thing broke out, there was a lot of talk on LinkedIn and, and Facebook, how hackers were reaching out to security professionals. Like, Hey, I saw your code and I want to discuss this thing with you. And they fell for it. And they, they executed uh, malware in a, uh, in a closed environment that actually <laughs> managed to steal their code and that's how they got they broke into a few places it was um i'm not going to say any states because i don't want anyone to come kill me but you know and, and i might even get it wrong so but there were posts on linkedin about it how a bunch of security researchers were posting hey i just got this message and i actually fell for it whoops <laughs> you know so it really could happen to oh, anyone if if the phishing attempt is 
you know, sophisticated enough. If the if the if the hacker knows what they're doing in social engineering, then it absolutely can happen to anyone. There there has yeah, to be that super level easy. of zero trust. Super easy. And I'll just uh, point out, Daniel did volunteer to come live uh, because he sent another message. No, <laughs> All right, Dan, I'm, I'm turning, I'm turning your mic on. <laughs> but he, he made the point in speak. chat about uh, sending data Hi. every keystroke. Hey, like Daniel. that's spot on. Welcome to the uh, Geekcast. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I'm familiar with it. <laughs> well, yeah, this yeah. Is so uh, th that is something I've not seen a, a malicious form do, but I do. Th I. If I was making one, I would make it so every keystroke you hit, it's sent back. So if the user was smart enough to realize halfway through, <laughs> you still matter. got half the data. Oh, yep. I jumped in with both feet, 100%. No <laughs> yeah. question. And uh, a, I DNS, would have deserved it. a DNS filtering product may have blocked this malicious link may have in blocked. its tracks. This, Just this saying. Is true. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> so DNS filtering is is one layer of many that would be that would help with decentralizing IT and 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 helping remove shadow IT, not necessarily or at least control it. I wouldn't say removing it is the right thing, but at least control it to an extent. Yeah. Right. I think um, control and is the key. We, had, I, what I get, Mike, I gave you the, the analogy earlier today of, of give the user a, a big enough sandbox, like a Fort Knox uh, style sandbox that they can play in, but it's big enough so they can't see the edges. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Put them in a prison, but don't tell them they're there, right? <laughs> Oh man, yeah. So, um, I don't know what Daniel, else talking about. I got a question for Daniel. Daniel, sure. uh, do you do you agree with the um, decentralizing of cybersecurity, like kind of endpoint first thinking? I, I think you have to in this day and age. Like, there's no other choice. The, the thought of like an always on VPN or even a VPN that users have to connect at the oh end of God, the day, <laughs> even if you have it so they can't do anything till the VPN connects. The VPN still has to reach out. They still have to be on a network somewhere that you don't control. And you have to be sure that that system is actually properly locked down and controlled in that situation. So I feel like at the end of the day, you need that level of security on the endpoint. The endpoint needs to itself be a self-contained unit that is safe. And then on top of that, you build layers of the uh, zero trust with you know machine level authentication mixed with user level authentication. It's all, uh, you know, as Mindy was Are saying, you, it's all layers. Yeah. yeah. So Mindy cringe at the mention of VPN. I, I'm totally with you. Supporting VPN sucks. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I also yeah, cringe yeah. at the mention of always on VPN. You have, like, there are some customers that we have, we give them VPN, even even currently. Like, we set up new VPNs for them because they insist and there's, like, specific needs that, okay, fine, we'll give it to you, you know? But then they're like, hey, I have a VPN connected the last 36 hours and now it's asking for a password and I just want to stay connected. For, what, what, are you, what are you doing? No, <laughs> no, you can't stay connected for 36 hours. You, you should actually be disconnecting it when you're not using it because you know, if something happens to your computer, you're, we've now extended the trust, the trust boundary, right? The thing we're trying to get rid of to your computer, which is somewhere else you know, on a network we don't really know about. And you're leaving it connected all the time. We have no idea what's going to happen. We at least do want to minimize the amount of damage that could happen, or at least the time period that damage can, can occur yeah. if something were to happen. I mean, the Are way we, we see technology going is everything more and more is cloud-based. Um, we can do SSO to do uh, conditional access policies. Mm -hmm. So VPN is a dying breed in our book because you need less yeah. and less back. And even where traditionally you would need it, now you can use something like the Azure application proxy and completely remove the need for the VPN because they can get through it through, you know, office.com. They can get to an internal resource through office.com. And so that's the direction we're going. Obviously not everything's there. QuickBooks on premise, Sage is not gonna work that way. eClinical yeah. works, they can do cloud, but it's still kind of just a desktop application. Um, so yeah. It's funny because it's mostly the regulated areas, right? So like accounting, uh, areas and stuff that QuickBooks we're talking about, Lacert, yep. you know, all those all those uh, tools that are all legacy and were designed for special use. Um, even EMRs, a lot of them are still like for medical healthcare stuff. You know, dental practice yeah. software. Oh my God, they're the oh, worst. The worst. <laughs> um, and and they're they're all they don't even know what security is. Like what? Just log in automatically so I can start my application so you can use your program on your computer, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you could even good luck could you even getting to worry if, about HIPAA. Yeah. Imagine <laughs> exactly. if these these vendors provided online, you know, cloud-based uh, uh, portal to the you mentioned dental, the two I'm sure you thought of, the same two I thought of. Um, if they offered a cloud-based solution there, I wouldn't trust it 
at all. Like that should never touch the internet. It shouldn't be even allowed to touch the customers. Like it's oh bad. Um, and so, yeah, and that's, I don't know how we're going to get past that step um, right. for some of these softwares, um, but we got to keep pushing. I mean, and, and cloud yeah. is, if you have conditional access policies, if you lock the interface to even see anything is locked behind, you know, like an Azure application proxy, you're actually pretty secure at that point because you need to sign in as a user. Conditional access policies mean you need to be on a ma maintained computer that's meeting uh, minimum criteria. Like all that stuff's great, but man, is it hard to get to that point with some of these softwares. Yeah, don't forget D your D password Daniel. manager and MFA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, Daniel, I have a question. And I, again, probably shouldn't admit this, but I used to think of DNS filtering as kind of like a nice to have or an extra layer, not necessarily like a necessity, right? Mm -hmm. Years ago. What's your thinking on DNS filtering? So ours is still, it's an add-on service for us. We don't bake it in in the base price. Had it been available 10 years ago in a reasonable MSP friendly format as DNS filter is, we might have baked it in, but adding it after the fact is just additional cost and you know the powers that be weren't going to just eat that cost um so we do, we offer it as an add-on service but we push it hard and we're growing with it quite a bit you know we we still want more we still want more clients on it because i do think i mean we've seen it work we've seen it save clients from dumb mistakes on more than one occasion so it's worth it um you know i think the dns filter the the only complaints I have are admin side of things from a technology side of things and getting, getting, doing the job it's supposed to do. It does it great. And I think that, you know, other umbrella, you know, your other your competitors in the DNS filter space, they, they work too. Um, I don't think they're as friendly as you guys are, but they work too. Um, but I do think that the system works and it's a great added layer on top of your antivirus, your anti-spam, your user training to some degree for as much as that barely works um you know all that stuff combined makes a solid i think foundation for security and i i do think that dns filtering is an important step in that yeah so and we appreciate that <laughs> so dns filtering generically at what point do you save enough clients from something that it becomes worth it to just say it's costing us more not to have it yeah, I mean, we certainly have done that in many cases. We have made that, we've pulled that ripcord um, on ver various systems to say, hey, it's worth all the time and trouble to get this set up and going. And um, part of it is some clients don't like the idea of it. I mean, to some degree, it is giving an outside party a look in everything they do, every website they go to. You know, obviously, you don't actually see the traffic, um, but you do see the, the generic top level domains that they're going to. Um, and so some clients don't like that. You also get some that just don't like the idea of being restricted. Um, so you have to be careful when you roll it out and make sure everybody's uh, approving yeah. of it. So, but I do think that we're gonna end up in a spot where we do just make it a part of our baseline offering. Um, it, it also, I mean, to some degree, we need to have tiered packages so we can make more money on people who are willing to spend it, but still have those lesser paying ones. And that's currently what DNS filters one of those separators now we sell it independently as well and some clients buy it directly you know just paying for that one service not the entire security suite we offer but we you know yeah i don't know when it'll come i mean antivirus we do that with we we no client of ours is allowed to not have antivirus bare minimum they get our antivirus and it just comes with the managed service agreement yeah That's, that, we do that is, we do the same thing with and with backups too yeah. so backups are also another yeah, essential backups. part we're actually re, we're actually redoing our our security uh, plans that we're offering for 2022, and one of the bases that we're hoping to include in the base base model is DNS filter, um, or a DNS filtering solution that happens. To be I think DNS you mean filter. the DNS filter. Mindy, <laughs> <laughs> um, after you've been beating us up all day, come on, you got to give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it actually it is DNS filter. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we're hoping that it, it allow us to, you know, cut down on like a, one of the expenses that we have with, with our firewalls that we put in is a minimum level of security services that they subscribe to, including web filtering. You know, if we can translate that cost off, because again, we can't get rid of firewalls yet, hopefully one day, but we can't do that yet. Uh, if we can translate they also don't cost, cover your whole network. They also don't cover the whole network or people who leave the network, right. So if we if we transfer that cost over to DNS filter, and then get uh, 
AI protection, right? Is that one of your uh, taglines? Um, I love it. For, We're recording this, right? <laughs> yeah, this is being recorded. <laughs> for DNS malware and, and other requests that should be blocked, and on top of standard web filtering that the customers may want, then you know that's that's a win-win for us. So that's that's what we're hoping to do on our security packages too. Yeah, and that's I think content filtering obviously you make as an MSP the productivity argument, but what we see the threat protection really is where it's at, keeping people and hopefully they're not worried about uh, being watched there too much. The trade-off of not letting them get to that phishing site like me, just clicking through random links and email click, 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 uh, or, or downloading that malware, uh, un unintentionally, uh, right. that that's, that's maybe the biggest benefit for sure. So I, I have a question that's very pertinent to everything, everybody right now is with, with, uh, log four J, uh, and, and, uh, the whole log shell log four shell thing. Um, one of the common things we saw when being probed was people were using DNS lookups using that to see if it was vulnerable. That was a, a test for vulnerability was DNS lookups. How did you guys react to, um, like, have you guys been blocking these probe destinations using DNS filter? Like, cause obviously if you're doing your whole network then theoretically those, you, you guys should be capable of stopping <clears throat> those probes. Now, obviously that doesn't solve the vulnerability at all. That just stops the probing. Another layer. <clears throat> yeah yeah so we we um the probing is seemed to be done with domains that we know about from what we've seen so we were blocking some of those probes um from getting through and we're additionally blocking um you know the, the malicious payloads that could be behind those dns lookups now there are things that we can't help with with log4j but we can certainly lessen lessen the impact a little bit yeah, and I think even even when you're not able, so first of all, the DNS lookups that were happening, Daniel, wasn't just probing, right? So you are able to exfiltrate with DNS. There, True. Yeah, there exfiltrate are, with There DNS. are certain things you can do with DNS beyond just probing. So and you know, he that's... also mentioned the the uh, payloads, if you're because a lot of them were downloading shell scripts. Exactly. So obviously so that, that DNS was the next thing I was going to say. It was like, hey, first of all, the LDAP query or whatever else is going on in the injection exploit stream uh, generally has some sort of DNS name that has to do a lookup for first, right? Mm -hmm. So the translation of the name to the IP there would be an, a, like an opportunity for something like the NS filter to jump in and block. The other thing would be, well, like you said, there's a payload that comes back and then it executes code, right? So it has to respond and, and then download the code. So depending on what's going on on that payload, there would be an opportunity to block that too, um, if it was doing another request back out. Yeah, and if you if you knew the specific domains it was looking for, you could just block those outright. But it's unlikely you're going to know that, which is why our AI right. is out there fighting the good fight, categorizing every domain that it can find. So, so that's kind how of where does your we categorizations sell. work? Are you able like to give us a? Well, actually, I think we're at time. It's three o'clock. Oh, do you sorry, guys want to hear this answer? Today. What do you want to do? No, see, we're, I guess we're hiding the secret sauce. <laughs> how long of an answer is it, Mike? Do you even have it's, the answer? It's not that long. We we have several heuristics that we look at for the, the artificial intelligence goes out and it'll um, determine based on a number of factors what a domain should be categorized as. It's it's um you know not not some rocket science thing. It's it's a simple formula that that just makes um, the AI, AI engine effective more so than any human could ever be uh, based, based on the speed it can categorize that. Which All we've right. been able to quantify. We should come back to talk about Mikey's research on that sometime. Yes, we should. We can do uh, efficacy. So one yeah. of the benefits of having like uh, single vendor experts in an area like a DNS filtering product is the efficacy of that product is going to be superior than your, you know, VMware, no offense, VMware, but you know they have like everything under the sun and don't care about much of it. <laughs> Sorry. Apologize in advance to VMware watching people for watching. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, listen, this is a lot of fun for me. I appreciate uh, you coming on here to uh, you know unexpectedly break off script and deal with my uh, eccentricity. And uh, Daniel, I appreciate you coming on as a guest and. Uh, rolling with it when i just decided to allow you to talk anytime <laughs> yeah that was a blast thanks for having us all right thank you guys have a great day thank you, thank you mandy